I'll introduce myself. Lane Sebring, um, family medicine doc, uh, board certified in um, family medicine, Wood School in Galveston, and uh, for medical school, UT for Austin, Austin for undergrad. Um, Lauren Cordaner wrote the book called The Paleo Diet and did the first sentinel research on that to actually demonstrate what was the paleo diet. What is our ancestral diet? What are humans designed to eat? That's the question. And nobody really ever asked that question. Oh, we're omnivores. We eat whatever we want. Whatever tastes good, you know, and whatever grandma made. But uh, this was a, a real attempt to try and find out what humans are designed to eat. And uh, so he says that I'm the first physician in America to base my practice off the paleo diet. And uh, I was lucky when I uh, attended a, a very small lecture, which he uh, was one of the speakers, and uh, talked about the paleo diet. About five minutes into his talk, I thought, oh my gosh, this, this changes everything. Now I've got an answer for why people get all these diseases, and wild animals on pristine parts of the planet have, have no experience of a chronic disease. <clears throat> and then also neither do hunter-gatherers, our ancestral um, uh, heritage. These people are living the lifestyle that we lived for 2.7 million years as hunter-gatherers, living off the land, hunting, the men hunt, the women gather. And uh, so that's the, uh, that's the paleo diet, and that's, that's what my practice is based off of. I'm also a board examiner for the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine. Uh, we have 25,000 members uh, from about 70 different countries, and the lecturers there are truly the best in the world. They're not uh, drug reps, they're not doctors uh, that come out of the, the curmudgeons that come out of the uh, dark halls of the uh, universities to give you a, an update on their research. These are people that are effective physicians around the world and really have something to say. Fourth generation endocrinologists uh, from Belgium, for example. Uh, to him, uh, the hormones are a symphony. He knows how to diagnose people by looking and examining and getting a history because his family has done that since the 1800s. And so it's, it's this type of input that you get. Um, plastic surgeons from Japan that do um, just miracle type work. And so that's the advantage of the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine. And uh, it's very nutrition based, it's very non-drug uh, oriented. So. You can become board certified in anti-aging medicine, and I'm one of the board examiners. You have to get past me or one of the other folks on the board to, to actually become certified in that. So that's kind of an honor. Um, so that's me. And the paleo diet, which I'm going to talk to you about, is, I've sort of already told you a little bit about, is that it's the diet that humans are designed to eat. You know, cows eat grass for a living, right? That's what she does. She's going to live 20 to 25 years, pretty much disease-free, having her babies no trouble, right? You start giving her grains, which is not their natural food, but that's what we do to them to fatten them up and make them sick and diabetic and riddled with bacteria, and then we eat them. But if you give her grains, you're going to lower her life expectancy down to about two years, maybe three, and she won't live that long unless you're giving her antibiotics to beat down the liver abscesses that develop because the gut becomes very leaky and the bacteria spreads throughout the body. So if you have free-range beef, which is what we were talking about earlier, a free-range animal, you can pull that out of the freezer, thaw it out on the, on the counter. Same with the get it from Brookshire Brothers or HEB, one of the other types, the, the grain-fed beef or lamb or pork or whatever, doesn't really matter. Put those on a couple of plates, let them thaw out, cover them with some wax paper or whatever put them in the refrigerator, come back three days later and you open the refrigerator door and one of them needs to be thrown away or given to the dog and you know, even feel like you need to cook it first even for them. And that's the grain fed. The other's still sweet, ready to cook. Put it back in there, cover it up, go to the mountains for a week, go to the beach for a week, whatever, come back, been in there ten days raw, pick it up, it's still ready to eat. Okay? That's the difference in a healthy animal versus one we've made sick. So that's, um, that's the difference with the, uh, um, the, the free-range beef and, and that sort of thing. So, um, wild animals don't get chronic diseases, and neither do hunter-gatherers, our ancestors. They're still around. We have data on 229 groups, and that's one of the things we did to try and figure out what are humans designed to eat, is to look at these hunter-gatherers. They, they don't have allergies, they don't have asthma, they don't have irritable bowel syndrome, depression, major depression, virtually unknown. Uh, they don't get diabetes. Cancer is virtually unknown amongst them. There have been doctors that have been treating them and seeing them for over 40 years. Uh, whether you're talking about the natural living Inuits, the Eskimos, or in the, the Amazon jungle or whatever, 
Uh, there's some down in, the, in India still. There's a few off the coast of India and some of the little islands out there. Those are apparently very, very intelligent people because civilized man tries to get close to them and there's a hail of spears and arrows coming at them trying to keep them away. And so we've really never visited them. But these people are very healthy. They're much stronger than we are. They're much faster than we are. Uh, cavities are virtually unknown. They don't get osteoporosis. Um, women actually get stronger after menopause. Stronger and increase their endurance because they're the gatherers. They've been on this circuit 50, 50 times, you know, during their lifetime. So they know everything is. So they need to be stronger. They're not taking care of babies anymore. So, uh, and maybe we'll get a chance, I'll tell you how my theory as to why that is, that they become stronger. But these people are very healthy. They can smell the urine of an animal from 40 paces and tell you what it is, even male or female. And their genes are exactly like ours. There's no difference whatsoever. Yet theirs are being manifest. They're living a lifestyle that those genes evolved from. And so we, on the other hand, are living a lifestyle that is in contempt of our genes. We're doing everything we can. Um, I'll give you a sidetrack here of, of a an example of just how, what we're capable of doing. I had a patient that came to me, <clears throat> 59 years old, just had a major heart attack, left ventricular heart attack, a big area of injury, scar tissue, uh, still smoking at 59, you know, that never looks very good. And so uh, she says, but I'm going to quit, I'm going to quit, I want to get right, I, I want to get fix myself, etc. She was motivated. And so, okay, let's do this. So she was deficient in a tremendous number of hormones. I put her on cortisol, growth hormone, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, DHEA. She did a 100% paleo diet. Uh, she just got on a weightlifting program, a resistance exercise program, which I typically uh, recommend over the aerobics uh, if you're going to choose one or the other. But she did all that. Then I sent her to a fellow in Dripping Springs that teaches... Uh, uh, a form of, uh, it's a really a precursor to Tai Chi, you know, the Chinese people, I mean, the movements and all this stuff, I don't know, how, I've done a little bit of it, but the, uh, she does, Qigong, he teaches Qigong, a medical Qigong, and he, uh, he taught her a very heart-focused Qigong, so she did this for two hours, twice a day, for six weeks, now that's dedication, right? She goes back to her cardiologist, and she had three major heart problems, one, the big heart attack with the big scar tissue, that was gone. The echo showed that that was normally contracting muscle. The scar was completely replaced by normal cells that was uh, now contracting as a normal heart. There was no sign of a heart attack. Her EKG showed no sign of a heart attack either. She had an atrial fibrillation, which is an irregular heartbeat. That can come and go, and the cardiologist wasn't so impressed with that because that can come and go, and it was gone. But she also had something called a left bundle branch block, which is virtually never seen to go. It's an electrical conduction problem with the heart. So all three of her problems were gone. And the cardiologist walked in after seeing an echo of her heart, seeing the, the physical contraction of it, and the electrical conduction on an EKG, and said, I don't even know why you're here. He, said, he listened to her heart for about five minutes, and he said, you know, um, what did you say you were doing? How do you spell that? Can, can you write that down for me? She's talking about the Qigong. And uh, he knows me and all the stuff that I do, so he's familiar with that. But... Um, about two weeks after this story, and I confirmed it with the cardiologist, um, I got a call from Westlake Orthopedics. And they were, at that time at least, were the only licensed adult stem, uh, stem cell uh, collection center for the state. And they said, why don't you come up here and maybe we can network and do, you know, we'll work together somehow. So I went up there and we visited. We talked about what each one of us could do when they were injecting stem cells, your own stem cells that they collect. And they said one of the things, you know, it'll go in and rebuild an entire new knee, a new hip, which is why we're involved in it. It'll also go and repair a heart attack. And I went, oh. So that's what happened. So this woman, through all the stuff she was doing, a combination or whatever, key elements of all her, her strategies, the one stuff that I put her on and Lou Everly taught her the, the Qigong, um, apparently woke up those stem cells, probably the stem cells in the heart itself, and she repaired and replaced uh, those, the scar tissue with normal contracting muscle. Now, those cells didn't just learn to do that. Okay? They've been doing that all along. But we've screwed up their signaling or something, so they no longer know how to do that. You see the difference? And freeing up this, this insulting diet that we have now uh, that uh, really messes things up more than I promise you, you ever imagined, then... Uh, 
we, they're not able to manifest. Those cells can't do their job. So, the other way they looked to see what the paleo diet is, is uh, looking at the archaeologic, archaeologic record. If you, um, if you look at um, that historically, what we find is that chronic diseases began in a very specific place and specific time on this planet. Chronic diseases for humans. And it began in the Middle East 10,000 years ago when we started growing our own foods. The climate had changed and um, became much drier. A lot of the plant life died out and we had to do something to survive. So uh, we started growing uh, grains by the, the, by the riverbanks. Well, that's really interesting. You know, plants, I mean, hunter-gatherers can grow almost anything. They have a tremendous knowledge of plants they don't need to grow, and that's not part of their culture. But they could if they wanted to. But they chose grains, and hunter-gatherers consider grains starvation food at best, and for very good reason. But they chose them for one reason, one reason only. You know what that is? You know why they chose grains? They chose them because you can store them. Okay? They need to be able to store the food. Next question. Why can you store it? That's a very important question. Why can you store that food? And the answer is because nothing can live off of it. Okay? The grains put toxins in their seed on purpose so that the insects and the animals don't prefer that as a food. It causes trouble in the body. Now we've learned if you heat them up enough, if you cook them, you get rid of a lot of the toxins. But they pale in comparison to real food. And the real food are those fruits and nuts and vegetables that want to be eaten. The berries, and they're calling you with their bright colors, going, hey, look at me, look at me. Right? When they're the most bright, they're the most nutritious. They're even scented, pretty compelling. I mean, they know how to get our attention. <laughs> and so we eat them, animals eat them, and then 10 miles down the road, start depositing that plant's seeds in piles of fertilizer all over the countryside. That's their propagation strategy. One rain, you got a bunch of new plants. So those plants have learned to feed the animals, and the animals learn to live off of it. So you get this co-evolution that takes place between the two. That's food, okay? If you're on a deserted island somewhere, and you need to eat something, uh, what do you look for? You look for color. You know, if you find something bright, that's the first thing you're going to go for and test it out. Or something that moves, okay? <laughs> now that's another strategy that's been really interesting for humanity, because... Brain size doubled when we started eating meat, okay? These vegetarian animals, these herbivores, they uh, sequester and concentrate certain fats that the brain needs, our brain needs, and we can't really eat enough of, in a vegetarian type diet to really support that brain like it's supposed to. And so, uh, and I'll leave the vegetarian jokes out at this point, but uh, maybe later, we'll see. The uh, um, so that allowed us then to eat them, and the work day for an average hunter gathers. Anybody know what that is? How long they work? Any, any guesses? Three or four hours. Yeah, that's right. Two and a half hours. That's the average hunter gather work day. We have data on 229 groups, and their average work day is two and a half hours. Wow. So what does that do? It leaves them time to ponder, to think, to create, to love. All the things that humans are designed to do. We don't have time for any of that now. We sort of mess things up. And going into the agrarian lifestyle uh, was, was probably the worst mistake we've ever done. What did that do for us health-wise? What did they see in the archaeologic record when this chronic disease started? Well, they saw a loss of six to seven inches in height. That's an archaeologic fact that follows the introduction of grains into the diet all around the world. That's malnutrition. Okay. The grains, part of their toxins is they bind up our digestive enzymes. So you don't even get the full nutritional benefit out of the more appropriate human foods like salmon, buffalo, broccoli, strawberries, whatever. Okay? You don't get the full benefit of that. And what happens to it is it gets sent further downstream unabsorbed and a bunch of bad bacteria downstream start to overgrow and you get inflammation and toxicity from them. And a leaky gut, a lot of you probably heard of leaky gut syndrome, and it's a huge problem. And then that's the beginning of autoimmune disease, where the gut leaks, and 85% of your immune system is in the line of your intestinal tract. I know listening to me is kind of like drinking water through a fire hose, I'm sorry about that. But we've got a lot to talk about, so hopefully you can talk about it and, and keep this in your head long enough to actually uh, remember it and learn it. And 
And what I want you to walk away with here is a concept more than anything else, so you kind of get it, okay? And then you get your motivation from that, and you can go back and learn all the details if you wish. But the archaeologic record shows us that that's where rheumatoid arthritis began, the very first known autoimmune disease. It was in the Middle East. And that also follows the introduction of grains into the diet all around the world. We had more frequent infections, more devastating infections. Life expectancy was actually cut in half. Uh, with agriculture, from hunter-gatherers to agriculture. Infant mortality went up with civilization, not down. The sphenoid bone here, because osteoporosis was also introduced at that time to humanity, the sphenoid bone here that goes back through here and supports the brain and buttresses the sides of the skull was no longer strong enough to span that original distance. So the body narrowed it. So we ended up with narrowed faces compared to hunter-gatherers. Okay. A nose you can't hardly breathe out of, and a jaw that no longer holds all of our teeth. So people need their wisdom teeth removed, and that need, and that crowding, and that problem follows the introduction of grains into the diet all around the world as it traveled. So you can see, not a good move. Um, there's a interesting author, Laurie Keith. She uh, was a former vegetarian, and now she's a militant paleo uh, person but has written a book um, called The Vegetarian Myth. And in this, she has a very profound statement. She says, when mankind put the plow to the soil, he set forth a chain of events that will ultimately end up in his demise. So it, that's pretty far-reaching. I don't know if that's true or not, but it's pretty scary once you actually see what's going on. The vegetarians like to claim that you know the people that eat meat are, are really the enemies of, of the life on this planet, but in fact, Nothing has been more devastating to the life on this planet uh, than agriculture, taking away the natural habitat. So we don't live within the designs of the planet. Now we decide to take it over and, and we're not running it very well. We're not even running our own health very well. We, uh, it's just like modern medicine. We don't know enough to do what we're doing, I promise you. But this is a way that you, this paleo diet, can become your own best doctor. I mean, what you'll find is the diseases, the chronic diseases. This diet cures diabetes in most adults, and it can do it in two weeks, okay? But virtually everyone with a modest amount of effort in about three months. There's a few supplements you may want to throw in there to help along the way. But it's uh, rheumatoid arthritis improves dramatically, uh, chronic fatigue, insomnia, depression, you name it. I have moms do this diet during their pregnancy, and the babies can lift their heads at delivery. Okay. I had one of them turn over at the hot dog stand while it was being dried off at delivery. A pediatrician told me that. He says, oh my gosh, this baby's got muscles that's not supposed to have. It's doing things it's not supposed to be able to do. Uh, no, that's what we're all supposed to be able to do. We're just so out of, out of sync with the way we're designed, we have no idea what our potential is. So this diet puts a lot of responsibility for your health back in your lap. That's the bad news. It's also the good news. And so you, you go to the doctor and then you get, you know, get screened for cancer or whatever and don't do those things. I think that's appropriate. But it also gives you a template. It gives you a model. So when the dietitians tell you to eat, eat, you know, well, eat grains with each meal and you got to do this, you can tell them where to go or you can just turn and walk away and pay no attention. Whenever I get a chance, I always tell them they've killed more people in, in the United States than uh, almost any other profession. <laughs> Nutritionists are different. They, they understand this. and The dietitians actually can't, can't even tell you anything different. They can't even recommend supplementation with any, you know, multiple vitamins or anything. They can get their license removed for that. And that happens. So they're all in lockstep. So, and that's who doctors use as a consult. They don't want to sit there and teach you how to eat. What's the point of that? It's all the same anyway. And vitamins are just become expensive urine, which is a declaration of lack of uh, how life works when people say that. Water does the same thing, right? goes right through you, but you kind of need it. And that's the way it works. So if you, we do need supplementation, by the way, just because the food we have now uh, doesn't have near the nutrition that it used to have. Broccoli has half the calcium it had in the 1960s because the, the farmers aren't rotating crops. They, they treat it with chemicals and fertilizers, make it look good and grow big and grow fast. But it's not near as nutritious. 
So here we are with, with an opportunity, a template now, that you can weigh what somebody tells you is appropriate for your health. And it also gives you a way in which you can really get healthy on your own. How much do you have to do this diet? And that was a perfect question asked by a chiropractor sitting right next to me at my first uh, introduction into the paleo diet when Lauren Cordain was, was lecturing. And um, everybody kind of laughed because that was what we really needed to know. And Cordain said, if you do this diet 80-85%, you've done yourself a real favor. It's the people with a chronic disease that need to do it 100%. And, uh, and they do, and the diseases go away. Um, you can clean out coronary arteries with this diet. Okay? It's, uh, it's amazing the body's chance, uh, the uh, capacity to, to heal and to repair. So, what's on the diet? Uh, well, let me tell you one other aspect. There's the three parts of this. How do you know a paleo diet is what it is? And the third one is how it manifests when you do it. My patients, I've got actually about 16 years of patients doing this and them coming in and telling me stories, you know. I was just doing this in sympathy with my wife, but the ringing has gone away in my ears and the pain in my neck is gone and I sleep like a baby. And, you know, and it's, you know I didn't really know these were problems that I had before. I'm more alert during the day. And you just hear this. And so they're, they're beginning to unmask the potential of their genes. You can't put diesel in a regular car engine or vice versa. We're designed for a specific fuel. That's what we have. Has there been adaptation in the last 10,000 years to be able to handle these foods? Yeah, uh, adaptation to some degree. Uh, but it's not optimal. Why would you ever choose pancakes over salmon okay, or buffalo or broccoli? Those are very nutrient-dense charged fuels. Those others, which are not on the diet, by the way, is all the grains, wheat, corn, rice, barley, and oats, all the, all the beans. Beans aren't food. They have the exact same problem that grains do. They bind up our digestive enzymes. They make our platelets sticky. They have to have saponins in there, which cause big holes to develop in the gut wall. And things go through there undigested, bad news, and a whole lot of toxins. And, it's, it's just a mess. Probably the real major uh, cause for uh, heart disease is that right there. Bacteria that gets into the heart and, uh, and promotes the uh, cardiovascular disease. So that's sort of a secret knowledge that's trying to be uh, suppressed. If you get a chance, I'll tell you that story. It's pretty fascinating. But these aren't foods. Grains, beans, potatoes aren't food. Those are three seeds that don't want to be eaten. Okay, so they're putting, and they're not trying to call you, they're not colorful, they're not enticing, they don't smell good, right? If you had a bowl here of chopped up raw grains, chopped up raw beans, and chopped up raw potatoes, that wouldn't look like food. It wouldn't smell like food, it would smell like dirt. It wouldn't taste like food. And if you ate enough of it, it would kill you. Okay, that's not food. So, that's the... That's how you can know what food, what is food and what isn't. It just makes sense. Follow your instincts. Also, what's not food to anyone over three years old is dairy. We're not designed for dairy after three years old. Babies are designed for dairy. We're not. I don't care if you like your yogurt or you can do anything you want with it. You can play with the butter and it'll say, it's not, you're not designed for that and it causes trouble. Wait, even raw milk? There's no difference. Raw milk is, is just a better version of of, uh, you're, you're not a baby, okay? You, what you hear as a medical student all the time from the pediatricians when you're doing a pediatric, pediatric rotation is, these infants, these babies are not little adults. They have a very different physiology, okay? Just to give you an example, there's a huge amount of insulin released with dairy, a lot more than you would calculate out from the amount of sugar that's in there. And that's great if you're a baby because insulin makes you grow, okay? helps you build muscle and bone and that sort of thing, but it also makes fat. And that's what it does for adults. It makes us fat. You don't want that extra insulin. Okay. Casein, which is 80% of the protein in dairy, is turned into something called a casomorphone by bacteria in the gut. Okay? So it has a morphine-like effect on the brain. It's actually addicting. That's why I get people yelling out, no! Yeah, <laughs> not my milk, bro. And I get this all the time. But I, I used to drink probably two gallons a week, you know. But I haven't had milk in who knows many, many years now. 
And so um, the casein causes a chronic inflammatory state of the gut as well. And it promotes viral replication. And so uh, there was a, uh, an interesting experiment with, um, y'all may have heard of him, T. Colin Campbell, he wrote a book called The China Experiment. Um, okay, well, this guy is about the biggest fraud on the planet, and I'll prove it to you how I know. Um, he went to the Philippines for 15 years and fed these people casein. That was their protein supplementation, all right? And he started seeing horrible problems. Uh, hepatic cancers in a four-year-old and that type of stuff, and lots of inflammation, and these people were just getting sick, digestive issues, immune issues, etc. And so he did it for 15 years nonetheless, right, and continued to do that. He wasn't through. He went to China, found another place, very similar circumstances. He did it for another 25 years. So he did 40 years of wreaking havoc in, the, havoc in these people's lives and inducing disease. But he came back a hero because he wrote a book called The China Experiment. I, uh, I watched him uh, get handed back 40 years of research in about six minutes by Lauren Cordain, the author of The Paleo Diet, because I went to a Boulder Fest every year. It was always a, a magnificent nutrition conference. And you better know what you're talking about because you're going to have to defend it against a very savvy audience of competing speakers. So he said what he was going to say, and they said, well, what was your protein source? What was your protein source? And one of the, uh, and finally he said, I'm saving that for the end. Okay. So we waited. It came out to be casein. And we went, well, of course. You know, this makes perfect sense. It would do that because it was a basically a paleo audience. And so then Lauren Card Cordain came out and he said, uh, well, when he talked about the fact that he had picked places where hepatitis A was rampant in these people. So now you had a hepatic virus that was promoted super overgrowth constantly, a leaky gut, chronic inflammation, etc. Uh, casomorphones uh, being uh, uh, messing with their brain, so they had all kinds of uh, problems, including addiction to the casein. And so, uh, after that was done, there were tears in the audience because everybody knew this guy got handed back 40 years of research and had previously been very proud. But uh, he walked over to Cordain afterwards. And I was going to see if Cordain had any, Lauren had, you know, room at his table at lunch. So I was going to see if I could have lunch with him. And this T. Colin Campbell was right in front of me. And he finally got up to Cordain and he said, I never thought of that. Uh -huh. Okay, I think my knees buckled, all right? I thought, oh my gosh, this is absolutely incredible. But he continued on uh, unaltered. He changed nothing. He kept saying the same thing. Uh, as he always did, and wrote another book. You may have seen the documentary Forks Over Knives, where he, he promotes vegetarianism. So you have to be careful. Um, there's another, no, I won't go to that, there's a, but uh, maybe at the end if we have time. So, let's see, where was I? Now I need my... Dairy. <laughs> yeah, dairy. No so, dairy. No dairy, thank you. Um, so, yeah, no, the, the dairy is not your friend. Okay, you can try it, but a lot of these things don't really manifest as a problem uh, until you've been doing it for a while, and you have to really take it out for a while uh, to, to find out the difference and then add it back and try to be objective about the difference. You'll see that a lot of these foods that maybe don't initially cause trouble will, will uh, actually have been causing trouble all along. Foods that you eat, real foods, go to your, send molecules to your DNA and determine what's transcribed off your own genes for up to 72 hours after you eat it. So these things have pretty profound effects. Now, if you're eating local food and you're eating them in season, because that's the only way you can do it, then those foods have an appropriate message that's seasonally appropriate for your genes. In times of drought, these plants will actually produce molecules to help you deal with the drought, okay, or the excess stress of the heat, etc. Because they really want you to survive. If the animals go extinct, these plants are screwed, right? They've put all this energy into these into these fruits and vegetables and everything you know, to try and attract you and, and to spread their seeds. If the animals go, they're done, you know, because that's just going to fall right there in their strategy. All that energy is. They're better off having some seed that got cast by the wind and go for ten thousand, you know, seeds a day being spread. So. They really are your friend. There really is a symbiosis there. Um, so those are the foods. That's how we know that paleo is what it is. The archaeological records, studying hunter-gatherers, what do they eat. 
and then the manifestation of the diet itself when people people swap over and, and do this diet. It is a learning curve. It takes you a while to learn to do it. A um, lot more cooking um, because everything has to be cooked or eaten raw. It's your choice. I'll tell you an interesting story. I have this little theory. It's kind of cute, I think. But I think if you ate the whole animal, you wouldn't have to eat your vegetables. Okay, we because they've got everything you need. Uh, there's nothing in them that we don't use and need. So, uh, and I know animals don't want to be eaten like the plants, but too bad. You know, we're carnivores, and we're more carnivore than you ever imagined. And a lot of people have trouble with that. That's the shadow side of humanity. Yeah, we're predators. Okay, and we're the best on the planet. But. Um, there's a story of a fellow that uh, was in his fishing boat out in the Atlantic quite a ways out. And he woke up in the middle of the night and his boat's half sunk. And he jumps, throws out this life raft, great big round life raft, throws a, some bottles of water and blah, 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 there goes his, his boat and he jumps in there. And so now he's surviving. He knows he's way out of the shipping lane so there's not going to be much traffic around him. So he's out there spearing fish. and. He's got some water, and he's able to collect enough rain, etc. And so he was eating this raw fish, and then, and then about day 19, he said, all of a sudden the skin on this fish just looked delicious, and it was like eating ice cream. He couldn't get enough of it. His brain's telling him what he needs to eat. Pretty soon the eyes just look, I guess he's scanning the horizon all day looking for a boat or something. He started eating the eyes, and then he added in the liver. And, you know, he, they picked this guy up on day 68, which is the longest anybody had ever been documented to have survived in a boat like that and uh, in the best condition of his life, okay? All this is, you know, probably cleaner fish. It's out of the shipping lanes, and it's all raw, and it's all the whole, whole animal, okay? So um, that's kind of an interesting story, and it can tell you just some more of the principles that I, I think are involved with this whole thing. Let's, I think we should open it up for questions. What do you think? Anybody? Questions? Can you uh, explain then with gluten, grains, what happens in the digestive system beyond if someone is diagnosed with celiac disease or whatnot? A lot of people don't understand what happens in the intestinal wall and why people start getting joint pains and all these other issues that have right. nothing to do with the digestive system. Well, I don't have any stomach problems, but I've got all these other issues. Right. Well, celiac disease is a, an autoimmune disease where you're actually... Uh, stimulated to produce antibodies uh, as a result, and you can measure these antibodies uh, from from the gluten stimulation. It's turned to um, uh, gliadin, and uh, the gliadin has a has a, a big part of the problem. It causes a chronic inflammatory state of the gut, and it starts to leak, and things go through there. And 85% of your immune system is on the other side of that. Is in is in our 85% our of our immune system is in the lining of our intestinal tract. So it gets bombarded with a bunch of proteins and carbohydrates that it's not supposed to see. Okay, we that's the cells in the intestinal tract are weld, spot welded together with what's called tight junctions. But when you bring in the grains and you bring in the gluten, uh, it causes a chronic inflammatory state, and yeast starts to grow from that, and these tight junctions open up. And so now you've got undigested proteins and carbohydrates that can sneak down in between there. Normally, what happens is the intestinal tract is lined with a good acidophilus, good bacteria for the gut, the, what mom gives us at delivery, and you can buy that acidophilus, and they have electron micrographs lining the intestinal tract up to 200 cells deep. So if you think about it, that's how something found in the body at one time is 10 to the 8th, which is this lining of acidophilus, can protect you from something found one, one time is 10 to the 14th, which is the bad bacteria coming through the middle. And that acidophilus actually produces enzymes that help us digest our food and uh, can kill the bad bacteria, kills the yeast, etc. And produces a fat that our enterocytes, our cells, prefer as a source of energy. So there's a real symbiosis between the good bacteria in the gut and us. It's really your best friend. Keep them close. And so that barrier gets disrupted and... Uh, Instead of amino acids being going through as an individual, and the protein, you know, I don't know if you know this, but it's a chain of amino acids stuck together. Normally that's all clipped in individual amino acids, and their carrier mechanism invites them through, and, and, and so they come like that. But when you get a string of them, the immune system sees that as an invader and starts making antibodies to it. And one of the things that we've seen is there is a 
a protein in the cell wall of bacterioides, which is a real common bacteria in the gut. And that, that protein, if it slides through there and we start making antibodies to it, certain families, runs in the family, right, that they make a protein in the articular cartilage that looks exactly like that protein that comes through the wall. So they're making antibodies to that protein that's called mimicry. So there's a crossover reaction, so you start attacking your own joints. And that's rheumatoid arthritis. So how do you treat rheumatoid arthritis? You've already got this stimulation going on. How do you, first of all, you pull out the gluten out of there, and you pull out the beans and those things that cause holes in, in the intestinal tract. And you get the good acidophilus going to line that intestinal tract and start the healing up those holes. And now this constant bombardment of your immune system begins to quiet down. So the number of antibodies that are made that are attacking you and causing inflammation everywhere. And I just gave you an example of rheumatoid, but all autoimmune diseases, virtually all of them, come just like that. When we name these autoimmune diseases after some person that discovered it or the end organ that's being attacked, but the, but the treatment's all the same. Heal up the gut. Get that working right. Calm that down. The immune system uh, will... I don't know if I did that justice or not, but no. okay. I think that's a way where people can understand how this all works. Go ahead. What do you eat for breakfast? <laughs> that's a good question. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, not cereal, okay, not pancakes. Um, I tend to eat a fair number of eggs. I tend to eat leftovers from the night before or whatever. That's what hunter-gatherers tend to do. It's quick. Um, and if you're eating really well, then what you can do, your body will begin to take protein and turn it into sugar for you, time-released, okay? So you want to think about protein as time-released glucose. It's a really cool thing because you can eat a ribeye steak for breakfast, you know, 16-ounce ribeye, and you're good till 2 o'clock, right? I mean, you can. And your, your liver is releasing that sugar constantly. You work harder, it makes more, all right? So you don't get low blood sugar any time. And what's controlling your blood sugar now? Your liver. Ask any doctor, what organ controls your blood sugar? Oh, this is the pancreas. Well, yeah, given the way we eat, with the slamming up and down with carbohydrates and stuff, you know, breakfast cereal, you, you know, you, you couldn't have done anything worse. With the dairy causing lots of insulin to be released, more than you would expect, etc. So. And what's really good about that protein as your source of glucose, too, is not only its steadiness, so you never get a low blood sugar, you never get a high one, you never burn out your pancreas, right? Hello, no diabetes for you. But for every 200 calories the liver converts into glucose, you only get 100 calories of glucose out. So you burn 100 calories. You get to eat this 700 calorie steak. But all the protein, now the fat's the fat, and that's the energy there too. But the, the protein aspect of it, if you're turning that into glucose, that's cut in half in terms of the calories that you get. So when a dietitian tells you one of their many misunderstandings is a calorie is a calorie is a calorie. Well, we, I just showed you an example when it's not. Okay? So it's hard to be overweight. You don't even get hungry. You don't get the cravings, etc. So a major protein source for breakfast, and fat for breakfast too, is great. If you want a little carbohydrate, you don't have half an apple or something to go with it. You know, don't have juices. You can have vegetable juices, but the the, the fruit juice is way too much sugar. It's going to cause a big insulin spike and drop you down. Let me give you an example. You got two lump, groups of lumberjacks, ten over here and ten over here, right? And, <clears throat> and both groups get up and have their lumberjack breakfast, which is what? Steak and eggs, right? Not lumberjack pancakes or biscuits, right? So they're working hard. They're, they're turning that protein into glucose, and, and they're doing fine. And then somebody comes along here, some do-gooder comes along to group B over here and gives them some lumberjack biscuits about 9, 30, 10 o'clock. Okay, all that carbohydrates, 100% sugar, when it crosses the intestinal wall. Get an insulin spike. Sugar goes up, insulin follows it, okay, and that ends up going, dropping their sugars down low really quick, and that insulin goes to the liver and shuts off the liver's conversion of protein into glucose. Why would the liver continue to make sugar if you just provided a dump truck load for the body? You see what I mean? And so, um, 
just to give you an example, two slices of French bread is equivalent to a quarter cup of sugar. It goes up just as fast and just as high. A medium baked potato is a quarter cup of sugar. It goes up just as high and just as fast. So, these guys are crashing. They're getting cranky, you know. They're, they're getting tired. They maybe even start aching a little bit or something, you know. And the boss says, hey, what's wrong with you guys? Get to work over. What can they do? They can wait for lunch and they need a carb fix. Get that sugar back up. And that's what the most attractive, what they should do is, is go for that ribeye steak. And eventually that would, that would get you there a lot quicker, actually. Thank you. Mm -hmm. What's your opinion of Wheat Belt by William Davis? Uh, I think it's really good. I think he, I think he uh, emphasizes things well enough to, where people get the idea of what's going on. There's another one, Brain Brain, by David Perlmutter, that's good. Uh, he's a neurologist. His website's really fun. It's renegadeneurologist.com. But he's a very leading-edge guy, very smart. What, and, sorry. Yeah. what about chia seeds? But, it's not really uh, as great as you might think. It's got some problems with it. Um, cool. is, it is it a grain? No, it's kind of a pseudo grain in, in that it has a lot of the same problems. Yes. So how do you, if you can't have milk and <laughs> dairy and butter and all that, how do you... You won't miss it. You won't miss it. You know what will happen? You'll walk into a room, there'll be a chocolate cake over there, and I'm going to tell you something really funny that you're not going to believe. You won't even recognize it as food. You don't recognize anything. It disappears from the landscape. So when you cook your steak or whatever when you start, or whatever your meat is, how are you preparing that? You just like grilling it or baking it? Oh, there's all kinds of rubs and stuff, herbs and, and Herb things like that. And yeah. And there are umpteen zillion blogs and yeah. stuff online that have awesome recipes. And, yeah, and there's, there's a t cookbooks. tremendous number of cookbooks coming out that are designed for paleo. You have to be careful because... You know, in fact, that was one of my lectures at the conference was that, you you know, they're calling things paleo that aren't, you know, and so you have to be careful. So it's very easy. No grains, no beans, no potatoes, and no dairy, okay? All the wild meat you can handle, fruits, nuts, berries, okay, and uh, vegetables. If you have a hundred dietitians in a room, nutritionists or whatever, the only thing they're all going to agree upon is that vegetables are good for you. Okay, that's it. So everything else will be controversial. You won't miss it. Okay. <laughs> everything you said is like what I eat. <laughs> I understand it. Yeah. Coconut. You feel okay about the coconut? Pardon? Coconut. Coconut's great. Yeah, you can make amazing milk out of coconut and amazing pancakes out of coconut. Just and coconut, coconut, well, coconut oil is really good for you. It's good to cook with, too. Mm -hmm. I think there's a big fear, though, over because we've been told for how many years now that, you know, no fat, low fat, and so... No saturated fat, and coconuts are saturated fat, yeah. So there's this fear of using... using well, fat. in nature, you get a lot of saturated fat. You get as much saturated fat as unsaturated fat. So, and when you eat a wild animal, that's what you get. So how can that be bad for us? We've been doing it all this time. Well, here's the story behind this one. And unfortunately, this is, this is nutrition, this is medicine, and this story is exactly what we're dealing with, okay? During World War II, we couldn't get coconut oil, right? And the women used to cook with it quite a bit. I mean, there's a war on in the Philippines, for God's sake. You can't get it. So, uh, the government sort of in, uh, had a bit of investment and asked the manufacturers here, the industry, to develop another oil, and that's when corn got really big. And so they found a way to extract that oil from corn, and so they had corn oil. And so that was developed during World War II. And after World War II, then the coconut oil became available again, and a lot of the women went back to the coconut oil using it. And so all these farmers, these manufacturers said, well, wait a minute. They went to the federal government and said, you asked us to do this, and we did it, and now they're not buying our corn oil. So, the government started producing all this research talking about the evils of saturated fat, which were totally bogus, and everybody bought it, including the, today's cardiologists, they're still telling you, you know, saturated fat. There's nothing wrong with saturated fat, and never has been. It reduces your risk of cancer, it improves your insulin sensitivity. Cancer and insulin sensitivity, 
The number one cause of death right now is heart disease, but cancer has overtaken it twice in the last decade of different years. The number one cause for heart disease is insulin resistance. So here you have the number one and number two cause of death that could have been treated all this time with, by removing the fear of saturated fat. That's what we're dealing with, folks. And now you know, and now you have a template where you can figure out on your own. And I hope this makes sense. It's a gift. It's not mine. It's nature's. I recommend you go online to YouTube and watch um, Sally Fallon's The Oiling of America. It's like a 20, 30 minute video that goes through the political history of the, you know, bringing vegetable oils into the market and the bad, how much went into suppressing the science that was obviously showing that it wasn't, wasn't good. Well, you know, I'm, doctors, my fellow physicians either love me or hate me. And I think they all respect what I've done. You know, they, some of them think, think I'm, I'm uh, crazy, and I said, you know, I know everything you know, and you don't know anything about what I know. So you think I'm crazy, and I think you're lazy. <laughs> all right? They have two tools. <clears throat> what are they? You know? Drugs and scalpels. That's it. And everything else, from acupuncture, which is over 5,000 years old, uh, has been denigrated, laughed at. And uh, that's if you want to destroy something, laugh at it. But here's the truth. Marsha Engel is a professor at Harvard. She practices medicine there. She's an MD. She said the pharmaceutical industry owns the medical journals. Nothing's been published except what, she approved, or what they approve. And she's former editor-in-chief of the New England Journal of Medicine. I don't think a more prestigious physician in publishing exists. Um, John Brown, who was uh, the uh, former editor-in-chief of the British Medical Journal and 27 other subsidiaries of that, said the medical journals exist for one purpose and one purpose only, and that's to serve as an advertising arm for the pharmaceutical industry. Okay, he resigned. She resigned. Um, Merck, I don't know if they're number one or number two now as a pharmaceutical company in the world, um, but all of them are going into India and China and totally trying to delegitimize all of the natural medicines, the Ayurvedic medicines, the acupuncture. We have some of the best acupuncturists in the world in Austin because they came over here from China because they saw it being destroyed. All of the young guys and gals that are going into medicine are getting no, no education in that whatsoever. They're laughing at it as being old and archaic, which is really sad because it works. And uh, so I was talking to a woman, an, an MD from India, and I was talking about some herbs, etc. and we were sharing a patient, and we were just kind of collaborating. And I said, I, I said, I guess you probably learned a lot of that over in India. She says, I didn't get any of that. I know a little bit about herbs. I got that from my grandmother, but it was never mentioned in school. So it's, it's really sad. Merck um, also uh, commissioned El Sevior, the number one medical publisher on the planet, they publish more medical journals than uh, almost all the rest combined. Um, Merck commissioned El Sevior to create, out of thin air, nine peer-reviewed medical journals. Paid doctors to put their name on research that was never done. It was created in a computer. Now, El Sevior admitted they had done this. Okay? Nine of these things. And so, here we have the number one medical publisher on the, pro on the planet that's a self-admitted prostitute. Where is the integrity anywhere? Why are doctors reading these, this research and, and giving it credit? They have no template. They have no way to measure whether it makes sense or not. You do. They don't. Okay? That, that's what this is all about. And this is what, this is what you can take away from here. So I hope you pay attention to it. I hope it makes sense. And I hope you're curious. Okay. Einstein said that uh, it's a miracle that curiosity ever survives formal education. <laughs> and I don't think anybody's more formally educated than, than an MD, at least on an institutional basis. What, if, what about Dr. Lindsay Duncan? What do you think about his diet? I don't know his diet. What is it? I don't know either. Oh, okay. but, but you haven't heard of him? No. Okay. Right. Sorry. Is that from the, the Genesis? Genesis Pure, yeah. Genesis Pure products. And just, I don't know what it is. Is what? it like a biblical diet? Um, no, it's just based off of all um, the whole 
traits and yeah. good proteins. But he does cheese. He's the one who does cheese. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's got a pretty good protein that they've pulled out of there. I've seen that. And, and uh, it's, I, you know, people, you know, soy protein's not the best, but it's the better part of it. You know, there's actually a product that I recommend for people with certain cancers, uh, genistine, that comes out of soy. People get, wow, that's not, that's not paleo. Yeah, I know, but this is, this is a, a, a medicinal part that you can pull out and use. So there's parts of these, you know, don't be afraid of that. You know, parts of these things that aren't paleo that it's not like, you know, uh, taboo or something like that. I don't know. It's been touched or whatever. It's not. You know, you can still pull those out of there and use that. Yes? It's no secret that pharmaceuticals are in charge of everything. Right. right. You know um, with this awareness that people are getting with paleo diets and the book mm -hmm. Gray, Gray, all these books, what do you think is going to happen in the next, say, 10 years? Uh, I'm not very good at predicting because... Uh, when I, when I heard that lecture by Cordain in 1998, I knew the whole world would be eating paleo in five years because it just made such perfect sense. But there's so much pushback, it's really hard to say. Um, I expect things to get really rough at some point regarding moving in this direction. You know, the pharmaceutical company, I mean, the, the uh, compounding pharmacists are getting totally emasculated now. They're, they're going after them. I don't know if people like People's Pharmacy up in Austin. You know, they, they said, "Oh, we had some we had some uh, tainted product of yours down in Corpus Christi at the hospital down there," and they've done that to compounding pharmacies all over the United States. So it cost them two million dollars before they were approved, and now they can't even ship out of state. Neither can anybody else. Used to uh, any pharmacy could ship anywhere, and you can't do that anymore. So they're just taking away their power. On, and and I I have no doubt that this that type of uh, Tactics is going to, uh, you know, in, uh, where was it, Michigan, they passed a law that you couldn't have a home garden because it wasn't supervised. I mean, it was repealed, but that kind of stuff is going on. They passed a law in, in, uh, in uh, Colorado where doctors had to follow these certain protocols, and if you didn't, you could lose your license. Who wrote the protocol? How do they know, you know? Their population, that where that study was done, if it was really done, uh, is totally different than the one we have here. I know what works for my people here better than what would work in upstate New York. It's, it's different diseases, different problems, different people, different mindsets. You have to have that autonomy. Um, if, you, if you apply the concept of evolution, if, if that's how we got here, and I don't want to get started on that one, but if, if, you, if you do see that as a way we got here, then what do you have? You've got millions of experiments going on all the time. And then you have what works. Okay? The problem with, with evolution is it's a very violent process. It has no concept of fairness, etc. But we can fix that with a very simple concept called ethics. Okay? You can have capitalism, which is evolution. Okay, all the all the all the the virtues of evolution are there, but you need to have ethics so that it's fair, and then you can get rid of that. And we don't have the ethics now. If you're ethical and you're in big business, you're stupid. You know that's the mindset. But you can see why we need this autonomy so people can can find out what works. There was a website called pol.net, physiciansonline.net, and I really enjoyed it because you faxed them a, a copy of your license and they gave you a password and you could get in and you could, all these doctors talking, you know, and you could talk about patients on there. And you could say, you know, I had this patient and I tried this, this, and this, and you all think my diagnosis is wrong or what do you think? I need to try what happened. You know, these people had tried all the drugs. So it really became an alternative medicine website where um, you could... Um, you know, I'd get on there and I'd start giving them just a whole list of stuff in a total different paradigm and how, you know, you'd get right back, wow, that worked great, how did you learn to do that? How do I learn to do this? I mean, these are people who are really wanting to problem solve and help their patients, whatever it took. That's what their goal was. And they're not afraid to learn. And so, uh, you know, this was growing to be an alternative medicine website. Then one day I went on there and it took me straight to WebMD. <laughs> and then two weeks later it was shot, shut down completely. It was about five years after that, I got curious and I got to thinking, okay, I typed in pol.net and WebMD, hit it, and about halfway down the page on Google was a website I got on that, and it turned out to be a business plan 
for WebMD. And in that, they said, we need to absorb these three sites, and one of them was POL.net. Oh. So that's how this stuff is set, shut down. If you, the, pharma, the WebMD is a pharmaceutical company. If you have those billions and billions of dollars, you can do anything. They have bloggers on there all the time, the, on, on, on the Internet, just, just causing havoc. That's what they do. And, you know, here's a simple example where um, if you buy fish oil, what you want is a triglyceride form of fish oil. It's four times better absorbed. There's no toxicity to it. And that's how it comes in nature anyway, okay? But a cheaper version of that is an ethyl ester form of the omega-3s. And all of us know in medicine we've, for a long time that you get the more expensive omega-3 because it's four times better absorbed and it's actually cheaper as a result. And, but when the, uh, I forget what it's called now, but the prescription version of omega-3, they've changed the name a few times, um, came out so that doctors could prescribe omega-3s because it really worked to lower cholesterol and things like that, improve insulin sensitivity and reduce inflammation, all those wonderful things. They used an, an ethyl ester form, the cheapest form. I was really surprised by that. And within a few years, you started seeing, they reversed it. They said the ethyl ester form is four times better absorbed. And it starts showing up all over the internet. Well, where did that come from? Okay. It wasn't the nutritionists. It wasn't the doctors like me that pay attention to this stuff. So that's what we're up against all the time. There's just, and so that's what I'm saying. I think there'll be a big, uh, there's going to be a fight.